I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International, and welcome everyone to our presentation this morning. We are delighted to have Raymond O'Brien from the UK presenting live for us. So first, let me say hello to everyone. Welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. Herzliche willkommen. Hola e buenos dias. Buongiorno. Bon dia. And hello. I'm Simon. I'm the host of the Past Lives podcast. And in the podcast, I look for evidence that we all survive death. And each episode of the podcast is an hour long interview with someone who's had an amazing experience or is a researcher. And I cover near death experiences, children that remember past lives, hypnotic past life regression, deathbed visions, mediumship and other related subjects. And across the 140 episodes I've produced so far, guests have included Yvonne Kaysan, Raymond Moody, Evan Alexander, Howard Storm, Penny Sartori. But anyway, enough about my podcast. It's been great that I've been asked to introduce the star of the show today, Raymond O'Brien. I had the pleasure of recording an episode with him on my podcast with Yvonne recently, and I found Raymond to be a fascinating man. He is a medical intuitive, and he has had this skill since he was a child, so he's no stranger to the fact that we are all more than just some kind of biological robot. A few years ago, he had a bad evening where he needed to be resuscitated 10 times due to cardiac arrests. And this led to multiple near-death experiences, which for him were very powerful and certainly spiritually transformative. Raymond is a member of the British Association of Counselors and Psychotherapists and uses his unique knowledge and experience to help people who are trying to process the psychological effects of spiritually transformative experiences and NDEs. Raymond has spoken at the prestigious Royal London Teaching Hospital on the subject of the psychological effects of surviving a cardiac arrest and has been published by John Hopkins University on the subject of near death and the lack of care and understanding in this medical world. And perhaps the only thing that overshadows Ray's incredible work is his impressive haircut. So now I'm going to hand it over to Ray. Oh, first off, thank you, Yvonne, Robert, Simon, and Linda, who's not here. Um, thanks, guys. Thank you so much. And everyone out there who's taken the time to register and just to come and sit. Much love from me to you. And I really hope you enjoy the next couple of hours. Don't forget your questions. Are we ready to rock and roll, everyone? Yes. Excellent. Right. Well, I've been waiting, waiting, waiting a couple of weeks for this one. I'm really going to enjoy myself. Uh, just to continue on from Simon's great um, lead up to, for me to, to come in and talk to you guys. Um, I had my cardiac arrest at the age of 47, and um, pretty close to 60 now. So I've been living with this for an awful long time. But I come from a family of seers. Um, my mother was German, my father was Irish. Um, Pops met mum during the end of the Second World War and, uh, and at Walla. Granny on my mother's side, uh, which is where the seeing came from, um, she lived in a small village in northern Germany called Neumünster. And, um, if the doctor couldn't help you, you were sent to Granny's. And if Granny couldn't help you, well, then your life was in the hands of God himself. So I remember probably four or five years old, Pops was stationed in Germany. And in, in Germany, it's a big thing after Sunday dinner to go out and walk around the ornamental gardens. And I was out walking with mum. We stopped next to an old lady. She had a great big black rimmed hat and a black veil. She wore black gloves. She had a stoop and a cane. And I stood to my mother's right. Omar stood to mum's left. And they started arguing. And the argument finished and we walked off. And I remember looking up to mum and asking, what was the argument about? She said, Omar had said it was time for you to go with her to start your teaching. But I told Omar, no, that's not what was going to happen. I said that I was going to teach you. So this is kind of what happened. Now, my mum struggled 
because obviously Pops was in the army and he was away a lot. He went around the world. And uh, so mum was left with myself and uh, my two brothers and my sister came later on in the early 70s. Um, so mum did struggle and I, and I can see that now with the aid of reflection. I can see how she struggled to take care of all of us really. So being in the army, we moved around an awful lot. And, uh, I never, every two years, the packing trucks would turn up, stuff would go into it and off we'd go to wherever it was really. And the thing that I didn't like about that was the change of schools all the time. Having a different accent made me stand out an awful lot. So I specifically remember at one point, well, maybe about six or seven, we'd come back to England for a brief stay. And I remember standing at the front of the class with the teacher and she looked down at me and she said, well, find somebody to pair you up with. So um, I kind of looked up at her and I spotted a young lad and something said, he's the one who you're going to be sitting with. And lo and behold, she picked this lad. So that was the first sense of me understanding that something was different. But probably a year or two before that, I remember I used to have a thing about playing with the drains at the back of the house. Mum would always tell me off. But it wasn't the drains that I was fascinated in. It was the people or the entities that I would meet outside when I would be playing with the drains. And it was, a, it was probably the equivalent of staring at the sun. But they were talking back to me, it didn't hurt my eyes. And I distinctly remember this for two or three times, but didn't say nothing else about it, just carried on with life. Fast forwarding now to probably my early twenties, I knew that I was different. I used to hear the stories from mum about granny, how she used to heal people, I used to hear the story about the family. And I was filled with a sense of foreboding. And the foreboding was is that I didn't really want to go down the same route as other members of my family who also had this seeing skill. Um, I'd heard about what happened to other members of the family, whether it be through drink, um, that was their way of coping with it. So I, again, I didn't pay too much attention, but I knew deep down that there was a choice to be made further down the line. My mother's brother came to England to stay with us and uh, around about this time, was probably into my early 20s, 24, 25, Dieter came to stay and uh, my middle brother had a pretty bad motorcycle accident and hurt his neck. So he was in an awful lot of pain. And Dieter had been in the house for maybe about two days. My brother comes running up the stairs. He says, right, 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 right. You won't believe what Dieter has done to my neck. He said, he's touched my neck and all the pain has stopped. And I, although I was happy for my brother, it set a sense of unease within me, a powerful sense of unease. And Dieter still had another three or four days left to stay here in, in the UK at, at Mum's. And I am ashamed now to say that I avoided him for them last few days because we just had this connection and I didn't want to be where he was at this present moment. Dieter really struggled with his side of seeing, uh, even though he didn't speak about it to me personally, I know he did to mum. So I thought, well, Dieter's gone. Um, I, don't, I don't want to go down that road. So I turned to drugs and alcohol. Uh, it was a sense of just running away, uh, not really facing what I knew that I needed to face. So I ended up working in central London. And I worked for a, an engineering company, boiler, boiler engineering company. And, uh, we went to an old lady's flat. And the old lady knew my manager who I was working with, and the two got talking. And the old lady happened to mention that she had a pain in, in her ear. And she said, it's your lucky day. She said, we've got Voodoo Ray is here. He has this, this ability to touch people and, and the pain stops. And uh, that, on the inside, I was objectionable about it. It was, it was something very private for me. Uh, but the old lady looked at me and I, I, something I couldn't say no to her. So with all of the tools that we had in our front room, I got the chair out and I set the chair up, sat the old lady down and I touched her on, on her right ear. And, um, the pain stopped. We packed all our tools up, done what we had to do. We left the old lady's house and we're now sitting in my boss's van. And, um, at the time, I was a smoker. 
so was, so was my boss. She put her hands over the steering wheel. And, and she, she looked, to, looked to her left and looked at me. She went, voodoo. I went, yeah, what? She said, I don't understand how you can do this work and also hold down a normal working practice. Uh, and I knew that I was going to struggle with this. Just, just knew it. I knew that something had to change. It was a uh, case of, do I jump now or just stay on the road that I'm on? Uh, to quote what Simon said in our last interview, I had a spiritual kick up the backside. And that was really what I needed. I needed that. And that spiritual kick up the backside came with my near deaths. But on the run up to this near death, I was actually told that I was going to die. And this was, I was on a job and uh, the guy was a bit of a keep fit freak. And I was asking him about exercising and he said, uh, it, was, it was the chest exercises, funnily enough. So I was doing chest exercises, did for about two or three days, had to go back to the guy's house to finish off some work. And while I'm there, I said to him, those exercises you gave me, I said, they really hurt my chest. He said, did you warm up? I went, no, he pointed his finger at me. So this was sort of Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm driving home. And the voice with a capital V said to me, you're going to die. Now, before the voice had spoken, I'd had experience of it. I remember going to work probably a couple of months before the event and had noticed the police were pulling over cars and uh, just asking for details. And I remember thinking to myself, God, right, imagine if you ran a child over. And I don't know why I thought that, but at the end of the day, and driving home, I turned into my street, and it was summertime, and that very thought came into my mind about, what if you ran a child over? So I deliberately dropped my speed down. I dropped it down to almost between five and 10 miles an hour. And out of the left-hand side, I'd seen two children, and a child no more than four or five ran out into the middle of the road. I hit her. She came up the left-hand side of the bonnet, came up the window jam and was shot onto the side of the pavement. Got out of the, got out of my van with the police. She was, she was okay. She had the slice of cuts on her arm. And I remember the policeman saying to me, he said, if you hadn't been going any faster, you probably would have killed her. And I said, well, I told him the story and he's looking at me as if like, huh? I said, so this is why I've, got, I've, dropped, I've dropped my speed. So that was the first poignant sort of, you need to listen, right? So there I am, a month or so late, I'm driving home and the voice tells me that you're going to die, Raymond. I get home. First thing I do, I'm disturbed by this voice. I ring my mum. Now my mum had been telling me that you need to change your ways. This is probably about a year, year and a half before my actual NDE. You need to change your ways, Raymond, because something bad is going to happen to you. And I remember distinctly saying to mum, it would have to be pretty bad, mum, because, you know, some of the things that I've been up to. She said, oh, it will be bad. And uh, I thought, well, well, we'll just wait and see how bad it can be. So I'm on the phone to mum. Yeah, I've, I've just been told, mum, that um, I'm, I'm going to die. So she said, who told you? I said, the voice. She didn't say nothing else. That was the end of the conversation. It was the first time mum would ever behave like that. And, uh, so I've got... There was nothing else for me to do but put the phone down. And uh, I have a sound room at the top of my garden where I play my music. And it was on a Sunday night. And I was a great lover of chocolate, peanuts and raisins at the time. And I did like drinking cider. That was my devil's brew, shall we say. So about 11 o'clock, I decided, quarter past 11, it was time to leave the sound room. Called my cat, Mr. Bill. And the two of us trotted off down my garden. I went off to bed. I'm lying in bed. I'm lying on my side. And I've got this chest pain, which I'm assuming is still to do with the chest x-rays, um, chest exercises. I do apologize. So I get out of bed. And I'm down by the side of the bed and I'm doing press ups on the side of the bed. I get back into bed. I feel fine. But as soon as I lean on my side, so I get back out of bed and I do a couple more reps of, of push-ups back into bed. But by then, whatever is blocking my heart 
is, is marching on. And I remember distinctly sitting on the side of the bed saying to myself, you're in trouble, Ray. You, you are really in trouble. I could, just couldn't breathe. I managed to hit the light. I walked down the stairs and every night Mr. B would curl himself up in the corner of my sofa. And as I hit the light on, I remember his just, I know he's got a furry face, but it was just the way he looked at me. Uh, Bill had been with me for over 20 years. Uh, and, uh, I looked at him and I could hear him inside my head. He, I, I could hear him almost say, you look really bad. And I replied back to him, yeah, I know Bill, I feel really crook. So I decided that I'll call for an ambulance. And things rapidly got serious. And I had a cordless phone. And I managed to hit two nines, boom, standing up at the time. The next thing, I blacked out. What brought me round was Mr. B. Before this event of me collapsing on the floor, I saved Mr. B's life. He was attacked by a dog and, uh, and I beat the dog off. Bill survived and I remember saying to him, you owe me one. So there he is, I'm lying on, on, on the carpet. The cordless phone is still in my hand, but Mr. B has come along and he's felt, I felt the rasp the roughness of his tongue on my nose and, and the smell of his breath, it was like smelling salts. And I remember looking up and, and coming round and just putting everything together and I hit the last nine. And I called for the ambulance. And it was quite late at night now, it's about quarter to 12. I lay on, on the settee with, uh, sat on the settee with Bill, still on the phone to the operator. She told me to leave the door open. Uh, she said, we've called for the ambulance, stay where you are. So I did and because it was quite late at night. I could hear the ambulance off in the distance, which I found really surreal, to be quite honest with you. As I waited, slowly and more slowly, I started to lose oxygen. Um, and I became one with Bill, became one with everything. And I do believe that was one of the most things that I do remember. And as I'm sitting there thinking, am I going to make this? Am I going to survive? Am I going to make this? The door opened, the front door opened. And in walk these two angels, these two paramedics in the green uniform. And uh, one of the ladies was called Rebecca. And she walked over to me and uh, she asked me what my symptoms were. I told her what they were. And we shuffled out of my front door. Felt like from a, a guy who was pretty fit, even though I did drink, uh, I always used to exercise. So the difference between being pretty fit and shuffling out the door like a 90 year old was, was really poignant to me. It really drove home to me of the seriousness of the situation that I was in. So we walked in the back of the ambulance and they put me onto the gurney and I'm laying on the gurney and I'm watching the guys move around and do what they have to do. And um, Rebecca turned her back on me. And for some reason, this is my character. I remember putting my chin to my right shoulder and something in my head said, if ever there's a time to check out, Raymond, now's the time. So the next thing I remember, guys, is I'm on the other side. Bang. And this tiny naked soul who is aware that we're now out of body. We, we know that. Um, because I'm naked, naked and sexless, I've looked down at my feet. And I remember it's in typical Ray style. If I make this, I'm not coming back without not filling my boots with information. So I started to experiment. I started scrunching my toes on the grass. And the grass was just not like the grass that we have here. It was almost as if it was almost like the finest fur. And I could feel my toes going into it. And the next thing that made contact with me was the wind. And the wind came through, almost like it woke me up. It went through me. I felt it come in from my right and then went out through through the left. Uh, and it was an experience that I've never had before. And that kind of snapped me out of it. And I've looked ahead. And there ahead was, was five beings in front of me. Um, everything was vivid. All of the colours were, were vivid. Um, three ladies and two men. This lady... She looked back to me and she smiled. And, uh, she didn't say anything else. And I thought, well, well what happens now? And I, I distinctly remember saying to myself, I wonder where you go, Ray, to get your wings. And the next thing, the second lady turned her head. 
and she's now looking. And then a third lady looked. And I'm standing there, well, something's going to happen. And I've heard the first lady say to a guy who looked like Santa Claus, white hair, beard, tanned book. There was a younger guy who was standing on his right. And I've heard one of the women say to the younger guy, Raymond's here. And I thought, thank God, I've been recognized. And they just looked back. And the next thing I know is that somehow I've teleported to the side of Santa Claus. And with this tanned book he'd had in his hand, I heard him say, he shouldn't be here. And he did that. And with that, I'm now back into the ambulance. And I'm thinking, this is still a dream. But I've looked up and I'm shocked to see Rebecca looking down at me. And the first thing that I said to her was, I'm really sorry about that. I said, but I come from a family of Sears and I was just on the other side there. And, uh, she said, do you go on the other side a lot, Ray? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. She said, well, um, we're still in the... I said, if you park up, I'll make you a cup of tea and I'll tell you all about it. She went, no, we're still outside your house, Ray. You died. Your eyes were in the back of your head. She said, we, we can't move until we've, we've had to resuscitate you. And I remember looking down and I had my first symptoms of, of a heart attack when I was on a little tiny Cook Island in Rarotonga. So I had my Rarotonga t-shirt on and I, I looked down and it had been cut. It had been cut up, and I thought, how can you talk about a T-shirt? So that was the that was the stamp of this is real, Ray. This is this is happening. This is this is not a dream. And, and off we took. And the, thankfully, the hospital was within sort of ten minutes from me. So off we take, and I'm I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what all the fuss is about. <laughs> Uh, but I'll tell them all later. This has been a, this is a huge mistake. Um, you, you've obviously got it wrong. I feel great. I, I don't know what all the problems about. Uh, next thing, we arrive at the hospital, put it into the ambulance into reverse, we beat back, boom, doors open. And it's just, it was just like what we see on TV. I've got banks now. Um, I could hear the medical team explaining my symptoms, given my age. Uh, so I'm lying back on the gurney, we enter into the hospital, and all I remember was the fluorescent lights just going over my head. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, you'll have a chance to explain this, Ray, but it'll be okay. We get into the crash room, into ICU, and um, I remember looking around, watching everybody do what they had to do. The staff were just walking, talking, earth angels, just, just loved them all to this day, to be honest with you. And then this little Irish woman, because I'm, I'm lying there, I can, and we have eye contact, and she tells me that we need your next to kin's telephone number, right? And I, I turned and looked at her, I said, am I that bad? She said, yeah, you are. She said, so, you know, we'll, we need it. I said, well, if I don't make it, I went, so can you not, can you just ring my mum when I, if I don't make it? You know, she's ill, and, you know, and they said, yeah, okay. So this is where it went from wonderment to fear that I've, I have experienced since with the last two near deaths that I've had. Um, so, but the, the fear of it, I felt myself, my body lose its heat. That was one of the first disturbing things to me. And I was aware of something in the corner of, of, of the ICU room. It, it, it wasn't human, um, it didn't really have a, a humanoid shape to it. It was almost like a blur. And I watched it come past my feet and it came over to the left-hand side of the gurney and I followed it and that's what disturbed me. I felt my soul slip out of my body. And I went to a blackness Either I passed out, um, a lot of the near deaths I can't remember, um, but the ones that I do were very, very powerful. So I've slipped away. The staff have jumped into action. They resuscitated me again, and I've come back to life. Still thinking what on earth is going on, but I know that I'm dying. 
It's the equivalent of being on a diving board and diving into the blackness of the universe. I felt that alone, that isolated, um, and boom, gone again. The next thing that I remember is I'm at a place, and I've explained this in the first video, it was a place called The Grey, so I won't go into too much detail of it, but it wasn't a pleasant place. Um, there I'd met a guy, California Dave, if you see the first video, he'd come to see me. So we had this discussion. Uh, and, uh, I was brought round by the staff. My nose was now on the ceiling tiles of, of the ICU, and this most peculiar feeling of falling backwards kind of splashed back into my body. And I'm now looking at the staff, thinking, what, what else are they going to do to me? And I'm very, very weak at this point. And my soul has left my body. It's decided we're out of here. And I distinctly remember myself as a soul sitting on my forehead. And I could feel my cold, clammy forehead under my soul's feet. And I watched the staff do everything that they were doing. And to my left was a guy called Barry. And we must have been quite late into the evening by this time. Um, because he said to the rest of the staff, if this doesn't bring him back, nothing will bring him back. And I remember as my soul, I looked at him. Um, and I remember saying, he doesn't know that this is going to hurt me. And he's hit me with this defibrillator and I've come crashing back into my body. I've bolted upright at a 90 degree angle, just like one of those Hammer House horror films. And I pointed my finger at the staff. I watched them recoil. And, uh, and I remember saying to them, well, I hope they still hope they forgive me. I said, I effing well needed that. And I pointed the finger at them and I, and I crashed back, just crashed back in, into the body. And then I knew instinctively that it was over. And I looked at the clock and the clock was getting on for about 20 past one now. And bearing in mind that I died dead on 12 in the back of the ambulance, which kind of blew Rebecca's mind. She remember her flicking the clock. I said, you died at 12 o'clock. The whole the clock went to zero. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. So I got wheeled onto uh, a shared unit. And uh, it's quite late at night by this time. As I said, getting off about quarter to two when they finally got me onto a ward. And for some reason, I don't know why, but I shall find out, is that for people who do suffer heart troubles, sometimes the night is the worst time for them because the blood pressure drops. And I started seeing these people being wheeled in and they were like ships of the night. They got put into their bed. And I, was, I was on morphine by this time. My teeth were cracked and I had a couple of cracked ribs. Um, so I, I still wasn't too sure. So morning came. And I remember lying in my bed. And, uh, and who should turn up? First two people to visit me was Rebecca. And she came with another female uh, paramedic. And I watched them come in. And what caught my attention was Rebecca went, there he is. There's the guy I was telling you about. And uh, she said, I'm, I'm glad you've made it. She said, we didn't think you'd make it. I said, yeah, yeah. She went, do you know how lucky you are to be here? And I genuinely didn't. She said, normally, Ray, we're coming to pick the body up. We're not coming to, to, to revive somebody with, with a cardiac arrest. That just doesn't normally happen. She said, so we're even blown away of how situations have come about that you know, we, we've managed to, to save you. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still sort of staring at them thinking this is this is just madness so they left and then Barry came in and Barry was one who really enlightened me of what happened that, that night one of the first things he said to me he said you you are really bizarre he went oh, I, I've never seen anything like that before he said just the way you kept coming back he said it was, it was um, according to my earth angel, she knows who she is. And um, she said, um, you were virgin on the miraculous ray. Uh, you know, we stopped counting at five, but we believe nine times we resuscitated you. And I always count Mr. B, who licked my nose as the very first resuscitation. So that kind of brought me up to 10. 
So I had four days in this in this hospital. And I was quite well known. I didn't know uh, because of what had happened. So they decided that was they was going to do an operation on me. I was going to put a stent into my heart. And, um, but we got lined up for it, got lined up for the operation. They, they took me down to uh, the operating theatre and they're prepping up everything. They, they've got the shocking machine between my legs. The doctor's a really nice guy. Yeah, he said, so you're, you're the guy who's been frightening my nurses then. And I remember looking up at it and saying, yeah, I'm sorry, doc. And he said, we, we've got the, the shocker just in case you decide to go again. Um, but this, at that time, I didn't have a do not resuscitate, which I have now. And, um, so I said, yeah, okay. He said, do you want to stay awake for the, for the operation or, or do you want to watch it on the, on the TV screen? And I said, oh, I'd like to watch it. So he's asking me questions. Um, what was it like? What was it like to be resuscitated? And, uh, he said, I've, I've been told that you said that you're a seer. I said, yeah, yeah, I am. He asked me about what do I see? So I explained it to him. I said, granny ran in the family. So we're still in, in the operate there. He hasn't started work yet. And, uh, he, he said, do you see anything wrong with me? I said, what, what, what here? Uh, he went, yeah. I said, can I touch you? He said, yes, you can. I said, do you know what's wrong with you before I start? He went, yeah, I do. So I touched him. I touched him in five places. And, uh, and then when I'd done that, I could see he wasn't satisfied with what I'd touched, where, where I'd touched him. So I beckoned him in and just to validate what I'd said to him. I said, do you have trouble pooing, Doc? And he went, yeah, I do. So I said, well, you won't have any trouble anymore. That's what I've been told. He went, fantastic. So great success, puts the, the stent into my heart and I get wheeled back out. And one of the theater staff came out. She asked how I was, she stood next to my bed and she, she looked furtively left and right. She said, can I be really unprofessional? Said, of course you may. She said, but I couldn't help overhear what you had said to the, uh, to, uh, the consultant. I went, okay. She said, do you see anything wrong with me? Again, do you know what's wrong with you? She went, yeah. Can I touch you? She said, yeah. So I touched her. And then again, I think it was three or four spots. It was in the, the abdomen area. And uh, I almost had finished touching her. She, I said, Is, am I correct? She said, yeah, you are. I said, something else. I said, a man has just been superimposed over you. Um, but this man's got something wrong with his left knee. And <laughs> she said to me, um, my husband is an athlete and he's damaged his knee. And he's in this very hospital today to have a, an operation on it. I said, it'll, it'll be a success. So I spent the last couple of days there and then I got sent home. And um, that was when it became very, very, very difficult. Life became very difficult. I didn't understand the impact of the oxygen starvation upon my brain. Um, clearly, unbeknownst to me, um, that I, I had problems. It wasn't until I got asked to come back to the cardiac rehab place when I was questioned about what am I going to do about my next line of work now that I can't work anymore. And, uh, and the thought hadn't really crossed my mind. And I panicked, to be quite honest with you. And the only thing I could think of was up until my cardiac arrests, the seeing side of Raymond was growing. There was nothing I could do about it. It was, it had its own fuel, should we say. It didn't matter how much I drank, it didn't matter how much drugs I took, it was still there. Um, the choice was either take the route that you're gonna take, otherwise we'll give you another kick up the backside again. And that was, was really frightening to me. <clears throat> so, I've been kind of sort of thinking to myself, you're gonna to have to say, Ray, that I'll, I'll get a room here at the hospital and I'll, I'll, I'll work on people free of charge. I'm a registered healer with the Healing Trust, which allows me to work in, work in English hospitals here. So I said, that's what I'll do. And uh, this member of staff asked me about seeing, and, uh, the member of staff asked me, 
quite a few members of staff had asked me actually about what was wrong with 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 them and uh, i remember i asked this member of staff to turn around they asked what is wrong with me i asked again you sure you want to know yes told this member of staff to turn around but when i work i'm in a very very lightly altered state and i i'd watched this hand come up this finger and it touched this person just below the shoulder blade and i said it is uh, i said you have cancer it's here it's a it's a, it's a millimeter in size and, um, the person turned around and had a real look of thunder on their face and i thought i'd made a mistake you shouldn't have said that um, this person said for your information it's not a millimetre, it's 1.2 millimetres and it matters. And where your finger was, is where they removed the tumour off, off the wall, off the, uh, the back wall of my lung. And they couldn't get it all out. The consultant said, I've left a piece in there. So the person said, do you still want to work here? I said, yeah, I'd love to. Would you like to work on the chemo unit? Said, yeah, I would love to do that. So there was a lot of tests to go through before I was allowed to work on the chemo unit. Uh, one of those tests or one of the things I had to do was to have a very informal interview and I was really nervous about this uh, because I, I don't normally like to be tested on the spot do you see this do you see that it's unusual for me to do that you know because none of us get everything right um, so it, it, it worried me uh, you know uh, and I know what people are like I'm a skeptic I, geez that, that was my biggest skeptic uh, you, you couldn't have talked to me that, you know, it didn't matter what you said. Uh, I was my biggest skeptic. I still didn't believe what I was doing. Even though people were coming up to me, you know, animals, you'd seen this, you'd seen that. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I go for an interview, an informal interview, and it's the staff of the unit that I was working on. And they said, we're just waiting for somebody at the moment. So we won't start just yet. And uh, this member of staff had come in. Um, she's all heard all about you and it's great she's you know it'd be wonderful for you to be here you're going to do some great work with the patients she said we're actually just thinking about you just having you here just to work on us and um she said do you see anything wrong with me and uh, fortunately enough there was something wrong with this with this with this person uh, this person had an inflamed left ovary which i had been told and, uh, so i'm at one end of the room and this person's at the other end of the room and I, I, when the person asked what, what was wrong, again, I said, what, what here? I said, yeah, these are all my friends. So I said, yeah, you had. They told me what was wrong, the inflamed left over me. And to my relief and to my great surprise, uh, the, the woman turned around and said, I've just come from the fertility clinic center. And that's exactly what they told me. <laughs> she said, well, I have a baby. Well, you'll have a boy. And she did have a boy. Uh, so that was the green light to work on the chemo unit. But before you were allowed in, you had to take a test, uh, like a TB test. So I had spent some time in India and um, didn't know that I'd contracted TB. Uh, I thought it was a bad cough. <laughs> I thought it was to do with some bad weed that I smoked many moons ago that I had some mold on. Uh, so when, I, when I've had this test, they did it to my arm and they turned around and said, if, if a lump turns up within 24 hours, we know that you've had TB. Well, within probably three or four hours, it was like there was a tennis ball underneath my forearm. And uh, so I knew that something wasn't right. We got back in, they got my results out. They said, you either were a carrier or you have had TB. Went for an X-ray, a bit of a shadowing on the lung because of the TB. Uh, but otherwise they said, your immune system is phenomenal. I thought, fabulous. So, spent time on the chemo unit, did some incredible, incredible things on the chemo unit. I actually learned that the soul leaves the body when it's heavily medicated. And that was probably one of the most learned things that I'd found. Up in my sound room, I was sitting up there one night and uh, I've been on the chemo unit now for about six or seven months. People have gotten to know who Ray is. He wasn't just there to make the tea and just to keep people happy. Um, the, 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 we had a small chapel on the chemo unit, so I was allowed to operate out of the chapel. Um, so I was becoming known rapidly. And um, 
I'm, I'm there and I'm doing my work and I've got back home, I'm up at my sound room and I'm playing some guitar and out the corner of my eye, I've seen a soul. And I recognized the soul who the soul belonged to and it belonged to a woman who was terminally ill. Uh, she probably had three or four months to live at that time. Uh, so I got back into work the next day and she was coming in to have her chemo. And I pulled her aside. I said, were you really bad last night? She said, oh, Ray, I was so bad. She said, I was maxed out on the Oromorph um, and I couldn't take anymore. And the pain was still there. She said, Ray, I was crawling around on all fours uh, with the pain I'd had. She said, why do you ask? I said, was this at half past nine at night? She went, yeah, it was about that time. So that's the time your soul came to see me. Uh, she looked up, she looked as if I was a madman. <laughs> She said, what did you do with my soul? I said, I took your soul back to you. I said, so what I want to do, just to make sure that I'm not losing my mind. I said, can we, can we apply some sort of methodology to this, some sort of research? I said, when you're out of control of your pain, can you write it down? And if you come to visit me, I'll do the same. And then we can compare and it will say to me that I'm not losing my mind with you. She said, I'd love to do that. Anyway, as it turned out, that's, that's exactly what was happening. So, so she was a beautiful lady, absolutely gorgeous lady. She was being seen on the floor above the, the chemo unit. She couldn't get her medication because she has such a fear of death. She'd become hysterical, just kind of on the floor, rolling around on the floor, screaming, didn't want to be touched. So at the time, I hadn't really done anything which I would consider worthwhile on, on, on the chemo unit, even though I was there to help. I'm sitting next to a lady who's having chemo and one of the members of staff come and say, Ray, we've got somebody here to see you. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you could do something with her. And I said, what, what, what's up? She told me, I said, we'll bring her down in a couple of minutes. I went, okay, right now, but we can't, we can't give her anything because she's just in such a state. So she came downstairs, she came down with her husband. Her husband was a huge guy, really big bloke and he, was holding onto the two handles of the wheelchair. And there, there was my friend in the wheelchair. And she just looked close to the end, to be quite frank with you. And I knelt down in front of her and her husband's looking down at me and I've looked up at her and I, I said, I've been told that you have to come with me. And she said, yeah. So I wheeled her off to a little room and we spoke. We, we spoke about the work that I do. She spoke about my disbelief of the work that I do. She reassured me that you don't think you'd be sitting in this room alone with me if they didn't believe in what you did. And it was a wonderful thing. And at that moment, as, as I'm kind of thinking, she'd fallen asleep. And the woman who I'd seen with the ovaries came in. And she, she looked at, she was so shocked. The nurse was so shocked that as she spoke, she woke up my friend and my friend woke up and uh, she said, I'm really sorry Ray, for falling asleep. She said, it must've been the morphine that they gave me. And I, and I looked up at the nurse and the nurse just sort of looked down at me and said, we haven't given her any morphine Ray. And I was overjoyed um, just to talk about this to you now. I can feel myself being really emotional about it um, because she was the catalyst, the, the lady that pushed me over the edge to, this is what you're back here to do. And there was so many stories like this. Um, I'd learned so much about the soul, how the soul is within the body. Um, and what I had found was even though what I was doing was great, I was so happy to do what I was doing. I, I remember my mother asked me a question, why do you think you're back here? And, and I thought, wow, what, what sort of question is that, mum? Uh, I, I don't know, mum. She said, you're back here to help people. And I was deflated to hear that. It genuinely was. Because the work that I was doing before my cardiac arrest, putting hands on horses, telling people their horse is blind, telling people on the other side of the world what's wrong with them, telling people about their, their animals, which even the vets wouldn't pick up. And it was getting to a point where I was starting to go into the horse racing field um, because of what I was able to see. And the reason why I was introduced to this field was because of 
what I was seeing was being validated by vets. And that was a wonderful thing, but you can't forget about the impact that it has upon the seer and me. It's, who do I turn to and, and ask about this? There wasn't anyone, let alone before I got to the trauma of the events that I had been through. It was, so I struggled. And then one day, I had an invite to come back to the very hospital that saved my life. And it was to give a talk about the psychological effects of surviving a cardiac arrest. So it was a full house. There was big wigs there from the National Health Service. One of their lawyers was there uh, to talk about the legalities of um, not resuscitating people like me. So it was, it was a full on audience. There was a guy there called Ken Spearpoint. And if any of you lovely people out there want to know about Ken, he's a, he does great work with cardiac people, uh, a, a, an amazing guy. And he interviewed me in front of everyone. And um, right at the end of, 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 of the talk, it was a wonderful talk. One of the big wigs said, Ray, if you could leave us with anything, what would you like us to do to help somebody, or, you know, cardiac arrest survivors who are coming back? said, you need a Raymond in every cardiac rehab unit. And uh, my brain was still kind of jelly at that time. And some of the things I was saying, I must have thought, wow. Um, I said, you need a Ray in every cardiac rehab unit. I and I'll do it for nothing. I'll travel around. That was how, how passion, that was the passion I had about helping others not go through what I had just been through. Um, so they, they kind of just nodded and uh, we left it at that. And then a, a tall guy came up at the end of the, of, the, of the talk and he introduced himself to me and he said, I think that you would make a great counsellor. And uh, he said, and in the local paper, there's a course there, it's a four year course. He said, I think you should take that. So I did. And uh, we're just about tying up the, whole, the higher qualifications at, at the moment. Uh, and, uh, so I've, I've originally passed, I had my ticket, but being OB, I wanted to go one, one more. So I'm just tying that up at the moment. So I was asked to come back to the Royal London Hospital. As Simon said, it's, it's a really old teaching hospital in London. It goes back hundreds of years. I was very nervous, uh, you know, because of, it was such a prestigious place to give a talk. And I give a talk and uh, bearing in mind that in between my first cardiac arrest, I'd also had a couple more heart attacks and they had affected the brain also. So rather than say die, I, I thought we'll have to do this talk. So I've done this talk and a tall guy comes up to me and he, he went, great, great talk, Ray, just great. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, I don't, know who you are but you're looking at me as if I should know who you are he said it's me and he, he said his name and it was it was the chap who gave me the information to start studying he had had his own cardiac arrest so he was a paramedic but he now runs a cardiac resus unit in, in southern England so for him to be there to turn up in front of me and explain the impacts of his own cardiac arrest and how somebody like myself and what we're doing at the moment was helping. It was just, it was, it was the icing on the cake. Um, uh, just just a, a, a wonderful experience. So we're, we're kind of into five, six years down the line. Uh, I'm struggling massively for psychological reasons. You know, ju not just thinking about what happened to me, um, but also what's happening now, you know, with, with the seeing, um, with sitting next to people. When I was on the chemo unit, people would sit next to me and, and say, well, whenever I sit next to you, the pain stops. I don't, and, and to me, I, I, I was over the moon, but it left me thinking, who are you, Ray? What, why is it when I sit next to people, the pain stops? Um, that this, you know, that again, there was nobody to turn to. And those who I had turned to had the best intentions. But now with the training that I've had and the experiences that I've had, I understand that a person's life script has a great deal to do with how they deal with near death survivors. Uh, 
uh, you know, some one consultant said to me, if you do die, he would say hello to the angels for me, please. And, and, and I remember thinking to myself, is that, is that the right thing to say? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Um, I was being questioned about why, why have you got a do not resuscitate? It's an advanced directive. It's very detailed. It's very specific. And, um, and uh, I, 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 I said, it's, it's difficult for you to understand because when you've experienced heaven, why do I want to stay here? So for me to stay here is a struggle every single day because I have something to compare. And, I, and for the first time this year, the penny finally dropped with me was why so many people's cardiac arrest survivors are committing suicide. Because they're clearly seeing things that hadn't impacted me. And it's been this year probably where I've struggled the most to stay here. Um, I had a, I mentioned it in, in uh, the first video, um, my heart stopped again in 2019 in, in St. Thomas's Hospital, right opposite the House of Parliament. And they're beautiful, they really are cardiac specialists there. Uh, but being a seer, I knew something was going to go wrong. And I uh, I turned up on my motorcycle because it was in the centre of London. Um, because of my PTSD, I don't like crowds. So, you know, so the bike, crash helmet, black visor, anonymity. Nobody knows who I am, what my past is. I've turned up at this place, gone up to the eighth floor, sat there, gone into the machine. It's a noisy machine. And, um, I was in there for almost an hour. Uh, but before they put me in there, they said they was going to inject me with some sort of amphetamine to speed the heart up. But I was on a, on a tablet called bisoprolol, which kind of slows the heart down. It regulates my beat and I blood pressure tablets as well. So my heart is being told by the meds, this is the, this is the rate you're going at. And um, you know, that's the rate you're going at. So it's kind of like driving with the brakes on. And uh, I'm inside the MRI machine thinking you've got away with this rate. And we were down to the last two or three minutes. And I heard them say, we're going to inject you now. Um, they, whatever they injected me with, my heart didn't like, and the heart stopped. And, uh, we got wheeled back out. So the, the, the seeing, comprehending that, guys, is something which I try to get across to other survivors. It's you know, never, ever, ever, ever give up. It's you know, if you've if you've got an intention to give up, drop me a line. Uh, you know, speak to me um, because just talking to an experiencer, whether it's a survivor, whether it's the family who are thinking, he's not the same guy who he was sort of post cardiac arrest. Well, why has he changed so much? Why, don't, why, why, why doesn't he speak to us anymore? And if we don't tell the family, the family start filling the gaps in. And this is where the problems arise, you know, because they don't understand, uh, you know, I wasn't really given any information to pass on to my family about what they could expect through the traumas that I had been through. So it was very difficult for my family, very, very, very difficult. So, you know, if you guys are out there and you're watching this, you know, source me out, seek me out, you know, or, or check some of my videos. There's an awful lot of videos, an awful lot of information in this video, as well as other videos. Uh, so don't feel so isolated. Always, always, please come back. Seek that help. Uh, you know, um, so it's 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 worth. Life is worth hanging on for. You know, for moments like this, talking to who would have thought? You know, my, my work career was a grave digger when I first started work. So I've always had this this association with death. So you know, you can have this amazing journey. Um, um, to, to be able to do this to, to help others is 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 just everything. To be honest. Just, just everything. So I can't thank you enough, guys. I hope it genuinely come. So things have been getting better. The seeing has been improving. Um, what was the most recent case? A good buddy of mine got taken off to ICU. He's in, a, in immense pain. He gets back home decides to contact me, tells me that he's been diagnosed with a 
with a kidney stone. And his words were, please, Ray, can you do something? He said, because the pain is unbelievable. Uh, so being a seer, uh, it's possible for me to work through other people. So I said, well, we'll, we'll work through your wife. Uh, your wife can put her hands where I would normally put my own hands. Uh, so that's, that's what we did. Told him what to do. And I think it was about half an hour later, got a WhatsApp picture, bing, comes through. And it's a picture of a finger. <laughs> and on the end of the finger, he's actually passed the stone. And uh, I, I don't know who was more gobsmacked, him or me. Um, it was <laughs> just pretty phenomenal. Um, this applies to, oh my goodness, animals, foxes. Um, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, on the time, guys. Um, but foxes in my time of isolation, uh, again, my, my sound room, I left my sound room and I heard something speak to me. And I turned around and up on the roof of my sound room was this fox. Now, when I first built the sound room, one summer, I left the door open. It was open for a couple of hours, came back up to my sound room, came in, shut the door, turn the music on, really, really, really rocking in there. And there's a little room at the end of my sound room. And at the corner of my eye, I seen something move. And uh, I've had another look and there's this little cub. It must have been about five or six months old. It had gone into the room. I shut the door. It had panicked. It had gone into the other room. And now it was peeking around the corner to see what was going on. So I turned the music off. I've opened up the, the main double door so the fox could go out. The fox has trotted past me and I expected it just to leave the room, but it didn't. It sat down in front of the door and then looked over its shoulder and just kind of looked at me. And I, and I remember thinking, you cheeky sod. So I said, go on, up it. This is my place. So I'm assuming that this was the fox. Fast forward a couple of years, about five, six years, about four or five years. I'm walking down, I hear that voice. I turn around and there's this pair of big ears on, on, on my sound room roof. And I've said to the fox, do you want some food? The fox went, yeah. I said, well, you better come down the house. So there's, there's a, a wall between the gardens, concrete wall. The fox is walking along the wall. I'm walking to the garden, I'm down to my house and I'm thinking, don't even think about it, Ray. <laughs> Just don't even think about what's going on at the moment. I've run into the house, got some cheese out, thrown it to the fox. Thought that would be the end of it. The fox came back the next day. She was a female. and uh, She sat outside my, my back door waiting for me to feed her. And it was the first time I'd had a look at her. She was quite old. She had the right eye missing. She had all bite marks, not all healed, but all bite marks all on her face. And some just on the side of the neck. Um, I actually called her one eye. So we started talking to each other, started to feed her every morning. She'd come every morning. And it was this fox. I looked at her and I thought, you've lost an eye. You, there is no medical aid for you. Um, you know, you, you look like you've had a really tough life, but you're still here. Um, she was the motivation for me to carry on. And she kept coming to see me for about a year and a half. Eventually, she brought a cub with, with, with her. So the cub, with, the two of them would sit out the back door. Some of them would try to get in through the bedroom window on, on, on an you know, early morning when the window's open, like waiting for food. Um, just a beautiful experience. And they still come now. Um, they're not as tame as they were, but the family still come. I had a certain call. I'd seen one a couple of months back, and I'd seen it on my sound room, and I, I gave out the call that I used to give to, to One Eye. And uh, they come right to the edge of the roof, and I, I said, I'll get you some food. Back down the house, throw it back. And so I've carried it on. But just all sorts of calling come out, you know, come out to marshes uh, where I found a, a peregrine falcon. So just, just got called from the house, come to the marshes to such an extent. Where I remember saying, all right, I'll, I'll go. I wasn't going to go out today, but I'll go to the marshes. And I'm on the marshes, which are very close to where I am, very old marshes. And um, at the corner of my eye, I've, I've seen 
a big eye, which was about five foot in diameter, and it made me look. And below the eye was this little peregrine falcon, uh, a broken wing. So I've spoken to the, to the, to the bird, said, I have to pick you up. And, uh, so I, I picked her up, took my T-shirt off, wrapped her up in my T-shirt, put her into my rucksack. And I cycled home as fast as my heart would let me go. I didn't even think I was going to make it, to be honest, but we got back home. And uh, I think there's a video kicking around somewhere of me talking to her. So it's, it's allowing yourself to hear this. It's, it's not a gift. I don't consider it a gift. I understand why people may think my seeing is a gift, but I don't consider it to be a gift. Um, I used to call it a gift until a lovely friend of mine said to me one day, why do, you, why do you automatically assume that you deserve a gift, Raymond? And I thought, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about that. I thought, how many people, because I say it's a gift, is excluding. You know, some people think if they can't do this, that they're not worthy. So I say it's a skill. And that's how I've treated it as a skill. It's a skill that I can pass on to others, which is really what I've really kind of started to do, to be honest with you. It's to teach my validated theoretical approaches, whether it be Freud, Rogers, Bex, I tie that in with my own near-death experience. And what I've found is that it helps those who have had a near-death or who have suffered extreme trauma. It allows them to know that there's, there's somebody here sitting in front of you who gets it, who's not going to ask you, have you sat by the hand of God? who's not going to be overwhelmed by what they've said about, I've been on the other side, I've seen this, I've, I've seen that. You know, this, this person, the one you're looking at now, will remain grounded with that. You know, there's not really a lot that you can surprise me with these days. And to apply that to helping others, um, I, I, I think I'm very blessed to be able to do this. And, uh, so to pass these skills on is, is something um, that, means an awful lot to me. Um, how long I've got left, I, I don't know. I should have had a, a big heart up, but COVID has come along. Um, so everything's put on hold. Um, I don't know whether my, which is something, if somebody else is watching this, be aware if you if you ask for a do not resuscitate, um, because it can go against you to be actually resuscitated. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind, or even just to have an operation, uh, which is something that, I'm learning. Um, so, you know, the, the, the big thing for me, Raymond, is what I have seen on the other side does not compare to, to my life that I'm living here now. So, you know, uh, I'd like to stay as long as I can. But if the heart says no, well, then the heart says no. Uh, uh, and it makes me think about, I think one of the, the biggest things I've learned is that this, this is the best piece of kit that we will ever be given. This is magical, you know, let alone the soul that operates inside of us. This is everything. Um, and I feel, and I, but I understand why people will do everything to stay on this planet. It, it is our fear of death. It's bred into us. If we went to Sunday school, you know, we have, if you don't behave, you'll go to a bad place, you know, there, there's a reward, you know, you've been a good chap, you'll definitely go to heaven. Uh, you know, we have belief in karma and all of this interferes with our fear of death. And, and COVID has been a real revelation to me. What it's shone out is people's irrational fear of death. It's, and, and it's proven out by we're shutting down the world basically because of our fear of death. And to me, that's, we don't talk about this until either the nearing death experience touches a member of our family or, you know, or, or we lose somebody. It's just really the only times that we discuss death. Um, and to me, that's not right. We need to start talking about what people like me see. Uh, you know, it's, it, there is a true wonderment. I believe that this different aspects that I had seen in my near death, whether it was the gray, whether it was meeting California Dave on the other side, it was like, um, Christmas Carol. It was my way to quote Simon again. It was it was a, it was the spiritual kick up the arse, and it really was. And um, you know, I couldn't have put that better myself. I needed this, um, 
and I'm, I'm pleased that it, it's happened to me. Um, it has been a struggle. I'd be lying to say that it isn't a struggle. You know, my heart still doesn't play ball with me. Um, you know, but you have to take as much care as you can. Do what you can. Always a little further is my motto. Just when you think I can't do anymore, just just go a little bit more, um, because it provides motivation to others. Um, and I wish, I, I dearly wish, that there was a Raymond out there who I could go. Can I come and see you? Because this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. Um, I, I've seen an awful lot of psychotherapists, psychiatrists, and psychologists, and the main thing that I have seen is the life scripts of these people which come through, which interferes with the therapy session. Uh, we, they don't talk from the survivor's internal frame of reference. They talk from their own external frame of reference. Did you sit at the hand of God? What did you see? What was it like? You know, what was the gray like? Um, they're not really asking about how is it for you, Ray? They want the questions to their own answers, which is, which is understandable. But when you're there and you desperately need help, and many of us believe that those who are qualified, there is that power imbalance and we walk into maybe uh, a counsellor's room, a psychologist's room, a doctor's room. It's, 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 it's an automatic sense of imbalance. I'm here to see you, so I need help. Um, and we, we take on an awful lot because of that imbalance. So my path and my thing that I'm trying to say to people now is if you have had an NDE or are suffering trauma, please, please, please ask the person who you're seeing what is their background. Because if you've come from a place where I've come from, it blows an awful lot of people's minds. Um, and, you know, when you want that help, you don't want their external frame of reference you want them to focus on you what's been happening and so this is why we see a high death rate amongst survivors so we can't get that help you know why should i stay here tell me why you know this is what i hear an awful lot of um, but i also hear when people sit with me there's a common theme to what they say is that you get it right we understand that you get it and i would have loved to have sat in front of Raymond O'Brien. It would have saved me an awful lot of pain with my family. Uh, this is something else I hear from other survivors, uh, the isolation that it brings. Uh, one, one lady who I knew bought a place up in on the Isle of Skye. And, and you know, this time of year, it's pretty dark and pretty windy, but with her NDE, the only place she felt happy with was virtually being on her own. It's hard to, to get the kind of help. And I think SAI, with what you guys are doing, is that I love, the, I love the paradigms that you're covering. It's not specific just to near death. You've, you've got this beautiful idea of, of hearing from everyone else. And, and I think that's the main core of, of what you do. And it's one of the, re the reasons, Yvonne, why I've come onto your show. It's, it's, it's like, because I can see where you're going with this. And I think it's worth to be here to help you do whatever you need to be doing. Because uh, it does affect us. Even you, Simon, you know, and, and you, Robert, it's, 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 you know, without, without gushing or anything like that, it's, it's huge. It, it, it's almost life saving. And, and I don't say that lightly. For uh, somewhere for us to turn, to somewhere to know that there's somewhere to turn. For those of us who've had the, the, the painful incredulity of it all. You know, I, I consider myself quite settled down with it now, but I still get deeply disturbed some nights about what has happened, the things that I see still. Uh, you know, I still use the seeing to plan my daily routine, um, still use the seeing to pick out routes. Not listening to picking out routes has, has led for me to be hit by cars, uh, that I'm just not not listening you know so there are ways that i have acquired of teaching this method um it's it's it, you know it's again it's not a gift it's a skill and i think we all have that skill 
Africa. So to be able to talk about it here with you guys is just just phenomenal, man. Just kind of yeah. phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Raymond. That talk was absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> Um, there, there are a number of comments and a number of questions, and I'll invite everyone now, if you have a question that you'd like to invite Raymond, please go to the chat box at the bottom of the screen and ask your question. Before I start with everyone else's questions, I have one question for oh, you, Raymond. Far away, far away. <laughs> if I may. Of course you so, so um, you've always been a seer and it developed before you had your, your near-death experiences. Did you find, like many people after near-death experiences, have an increase in their mediumistic and psychic abilities? Did you find your seeing ability increased uh, yeah, I after your near NDEs? I did, um, which, which I found quite disturbing. Um, I, I thought it couldn't get any, <laughs> I couldn't get any more, I couldn't peak any more um, until the foxes started appearing. Um, and uh, just, just unusual stuff, just, um, just, how can I say, so this, it's almost been like told 10 jokes and somebody says, well, tell me one, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, um, things that really disturbed me, or still do disturb me, is my connection with animals. That's probably um, something that has really come to light. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'd, 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 I'd worked with um, animals before my, my near death. In, in actual fact, uh, this is where my career was going. I thought I could leave my engineering background, my mechanical engineering background, and, and I could do what, 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 what my granny was doing. How, how fabulous was that? Um, but it, it didn't go in, in, in the direction that I wanted to go. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, back to Simon, it was that kick up the backside. Um, but I had noticed when I got out of hospital, um, just thinking about what I'd done after my death experiences just with, um, I'll give you a for instance, I had to be blue lighted again, second time to um, St. George's Hospital. I had trouble in, in, in my doctors. And, um, so I was taken to St. Thomas's. There's another beautiful story about that where I'd, I'd met Santa Claus he was in the bed opposite. Remember what I told you, man? You know, with the, with the beard and the, mm -hmm. with the brown book. Perhaps we'll save that for, for, for another one. Um, but they were going to do another heart op on me. And I was in the right place for it. They said, it's a complicated procedure. Uh, I remember saying to Fred the Angel, who was in the bed opposite me, he was a D-Day veteran. And he was another seer healer who knew friends that I had. And he was the dead spit of Santa Claus. On the other side and for me to be sitting and having a bed next to him in a four bed unit i spent nine days with him and as i said that's that's another story um but one of the german nurses was fascinated that um, there was two healers on the same unit and um when i explained to um the consultant he said we're going to do the operation on you tomorrow and i said it's not going to go it's not going to go well and he went, we've got the best cardiac surgeons here and i said i'm just saying what you know and he said well we, we've we've heard about you uh, so the next morning comes and they prep me up and um, we're going to do whatever this thing that was going to do in my heart that they couldn't do at the other hospital and a guy turns up with the with the wheelchair and tells me to, to get into the wheelchair and uh off we go. And he, he says to me, and I was shocked. He said, I've heard all about you from Darren Valley Hospital. And, I, and I, I'm thinking, flipping heck. So I've looked up at him, went, oh yes, what have you heard then, fella? He said, they told me all about you. I said, uh, he said, give me a, give me a for instance. Uh, I said, you're an athlete and you haven't ran for three months because you've got something wrong with your right ankle. <laughs> we were at the lift by then. Um, and uh, he, he, he sort of leaned over and he looked at me. He went, "How did you know that?" I said, "Because that's what your soul has told me." And he was he was he was gushing. And as he was gushing, the lift doors opened. You know, um, and, and he's wheeled me in into the lift. You know what people are like in lifts? They, they don't they just start staring, don't they? So he was he was almost like chomping at the bit. Doors open, 
we're up, we're up top. Uh, the, he leads me outside the uh, the operating theatre, and, and he said, "I don't know how you've seen it." He said, "But you're absolutely right." I said, "You'll be back running again in a couple of months. Just take it easy." <laughs> so they wheel me in, and they put me onto the gurney. And uh, strangely enough, there's another Irish crash nurse there, and there's two heart surgeons there, and they're saying, "This is what we're going to do." Uh, and, um, they've got the, the the guy. I think he was the anaesthetist. I think. But he was looking at the computer screen at all of my vitals. And um, the Irish nurse starts asking me, what was I an engineer? And I said I was a heating engineer. Uh, so she starts asking me about her boiler while we're in the operating theatre. I'm telling her how to repair her boiler. Um, and then they go, right, we're ready. And I said to the consultant, this isn't going to go well. Yeah, he went, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. So they, they start to prep me. And I don't know what's happened, but I've noticed the guy to my left who's looking at the computer screen at my vitals. And he shuffled uncomfortable. I thought, here he comes. And uh, so the two consultants look over me and they go, we'll come back in a couple of minutes. Anyway, they come back and they've cancelled the operation. They said, we, we, we can't continue. If we make a mistake at this point, then, you know, because the wall of your heart is so thin, if what we need to do, we pierce it. He said, we, we, you know, you won't, you won't make it. And, uh, so that was the seeing side so yeah it had it's, it's increased dramatically yeah. and i believe it has Yvonne, because of the oxygen starvation it's almost like one has compensated the other yeah. uh, i now know what i struggle with you know any sort of numbers memory um and this is where i ask myself how are we going to do this today ray can you do this today and it's that skill of listening against all the experiences that I've had, you know, bearing in mind that I was told, I knew I was going to die. So it, it, I can't go against that. Uh, and this is what I've been building on. So yeah, it has been so intense. Sometimes I, 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 I'm shocked for maybe a day and a half, two days about some of the things that I, I, I do. Uh, and trust me, guys, I've had a really colorful life. I've seen an awful lot of stuff, uh, but when I see what Raymond O'Brien does, it just kind of stops me. <laughs> well, Raymond, Raymond, we have a lot of questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move you on to some of the questions. We had a number of people have just said hello. Hello from California. Hello from Toronto. Hello from Iowa. Hello from Buffalo, New York. Hello from Kamloops, BC. Just so you know, all over North America, hi, people are saying Love hi. You all. <laughs> Now, this, now, then we have a bunch of questions. So the first question came from Londo Malari, and she wants to know what your feeling is about diseases moving from one person to another. Do you think disease is an entity on its own, or perhaps the other person is being empathic and taking on another person's disease as in a journey? I love that question and um, I believe yes. The reason why I say that is um, I was in a hospital, I was in a office environment and um, one of the ladies in, the, in, in this environment had already had a uh, vasectomy. And that, that, I love these, 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 two, these two people, I absolutely love them. And um, while we were having coffee, I'd seen something come out of the back of the lady who had the mastectomy and it went into her best friend. That was, that was what I'd seen. And I was, I was sad at that to see that because I, I kind of knew what the outcome was. Because when I was on the chemo unit, I'd, I'd noticed this. I had to make my peace with the cancer. I, I had to. Um, I remember there was a, a, a guy who was on, he was having his chemo and he was asleep or just kind of nodding. And as I went to walk by him, he was still sitting asleep. As I went by him, something inside him looked up at me and snarled at me. And I remember walking by and I went straight into the kitchen area which was on the chemo unit and I was shocked at that it disturbed me but it told me that you have to make your peace with what's going on here Ray so with that in mind I'm in the office environment and I see it jump from, from one 
to another. And I went and had coffee with the workmate. And the workmate asked me, did you see, did you see it jump? And uh, I, I said, yes, I did. And the person said, why didn't you tell me at the time? You know, she said, I knew you, you had seen it because when we asked you before, you didn't say anything. I couldn't, I, you know, I love these two. How could I, even if I got it wrong, you know? So it, it brings a, a massive responsibility. So I, I just thought, I, I, I kind of did this. I turned away um, and I left it at that. And in answer to Londo's question, we met up. We met up in the, in the last year. And um, I was waiting, waiting for the person to turn up. The person turned up in front of me, and, and to me, when I see somebody who has cancer, they have a certain color and a certain smell to them. It's like a mustard color, and I seem to pick it up quickly. Um, and then it follows with, with a sense of smell. Um, that's not so profound anymore because the heart attack took my sense of smell away. Um, so it's more sort of a visual. So I'm sitting, waiting for, for my friend to turn up. My friend has turned up, I've seen, seen the color. We've actually sat down and we spoke about this. And, uh, and before, before I'd come clean, I did a drawing uh, because I hadn't seen my friend for quite a while. So I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what the symptoms were. So being a seer and being one who needs to validate and show some people that this is what I have seen uh, you know, before you tell me, um, so that's what's happened. So I'm sitting with this beautiful person. Person questions me, did you see it, Raya? Um, um, I said, yeah, I did. No, you know. But why didn't you say anything? I said, I didn't say anything because in case I was wrong, you know? Uh, and, uh, how, could I, how could I burden you with that, let alone burden myself with it? So I said, so what is wrong with you? And uh, lo and behold, that they told me what it, what it was, where it is, and uh, I, I, I said, hang on. And I got out my drawing, dated. Uh, you know, I said, is this where it is? And uh, she said, that, that's it. That's exactly where it is. Uh, you know? um, thankfully, the person didn't ask me, would, would that finish them off? Like, you know? and, um, it, was, it was something I still can't answer at, at this moment. But yes, in answer to Londo's question, I know there's going to be so many people out there going, what a load of claptrap, but that's, I'm telling you what I have seen. Mm -hmm. and, and not only have I seen it, but it is, it's been, you know, it's been backed up. People, this is why Amit Keynes, I can, I can tell you about Amit Keynes because it's on his show. I did a show, man dies 10 times, goes to heaven, Amit Keynes. Um, I had a second show with him. And before I went to see him, and I know he wouldn't mind me seeing this because I've explained it on his show is I did a drawing of what was wrong with him. And, and I gave a time, we put a time on it. And uh, I sat down and had a cup of tea with him before we filmed the show and uh, produced this. And he went, you're absolutely correct. And he mentioned it on the part two show. So it's that validation. And I need that validation because, you know, doctors like to see results. This is how we get results. It's research methodology and, and you know, so I've decided that for me to, to move through hospitals, I'm not coming across as some sort of crackpot woo-woo guy. Um, you know, I can validate what I've seen here. I send myself emails you know, about what I see. You know, sometimes the symptoms won't arise for, for, for sort of three years. I'll see it before an MRI scans here. And, uh, so I now record my scenes. So we can pull them back out and go to other seers who don't believe what they see. It's that, you know, you have to document what you see. You need to back it up with evidence, not just for those who disbelieve you, but for your own sanity. And, and this is what, what's brought it to me. So seeing it jump from one to another, yes, yes, Londo, yeah. Okay, wow, we have a number of questions. We have a number of comments. So I'm gonna to stick to the questions now. And if we have time at the end, I'll read the comments. So this question, Raymond, is uh, from Dini. She says, if I understand correctly, 
Raymond suggested that the current healer's life script and their training within the current system can actually interfere with what is required for a patient's healing. As a, as a, as a yes, yes, it, it can. She's absolutely correct. Um, when we're dealing with other professionals, the professionals must be aware of their life scripts. It's, it's like as a, as a survivor, I'll give you, I'll give you a, for instance, there was a, uh, the, one of the guys who thankfully, um, he was dealing with soldiers and, um, after all of the counselors, I've been with counselors and psychiatrists. So that one psychiatrist was, she was so blown away with the way I worked. Um, she ended up stalking me. <laughs> so, so these are the impacts. Another, Another counsellor um, would, would always want to touch my hand um, or want, want to play with my hair. Um, you know, so it's, it's this that, that it does to them. They're not seeing what is happening. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, the guy who spotted me, he spotted my PTSD. He was an amazing guy. Um, but this is where his life script comes in. He actually said to me, Ray, uh, there's an old boy who I drink with down down the pub, and um, he's told me there's something wrong with him. We really love him in this pub, and I, I would like you to tell me what's wrong with him. And, uh, so I thought, well, it's a bit unprofessional, but I like you, uh, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll help you out. And I went home, and I came back the following week, and I'd done a drawing. And, uh, because in between that time, when I, I was coming back to see him, the guy in the pub was going to get the results for his test, so the timing was perfect. So I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having my therapy session with him. And uh, I said, the old boy, the old boy from the pub, how did his test results go? And, uh, so he, he told me, told me what I had seen. And I was correct. I, I, I said, I said, your old boy, I said, he's got cancer. That's what I've seen. And that's what I did a drawing of where it was. And, I, and I'd shown it to him. I said, this is, this is what's wrong with him. And he was gobsmacked to such a point that he actually asked me what was wrong with him. And I told him. So it, it does influence the professionals. When you get somebody with my experiences or others similar, it does rock their boat. It, uh, you know, I, I have to, I've, I've been attacked. Uh, I've been attacked in the States um, uh, by, by a woman. Um, so that was even more shocking. Um, she, kicking me under the table. Uh, the, um, yeah, she didn't like the approach that, that where I was coming from. Um, so yeah, it's, this is, this is difficult. You know, it can be, um, it can get me in, into a lot of trouble mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of, of the way that I operate. So yeah, um, it does affect healers. We need to be aware of the transference and the counter transference. You know, these are something which a lot of people don't understand. And for us survivors who are going to seek help, we have absolute trust in that person's qualification. We can't see what their life script has been until they've probably had quite a bit of an impact. Um, a friend of mine is a policeman, he's now retired. Um, he had seen some of the most horrific things. The insurance company who was paying his um, income protection, asked him to come to see a psychologist. So the guy goes along, he's thinking the psychologist is used to dealing with somebody who has seen what he has seen. He sits in front of the psychologist, the psychologist says, so yeah, so in order for me to put your, your claim through, you know, you need to explain to me, what is it that has given you PTSD? And now the guy, he needs that money. The police have needed that money. He needs this resolved so he can keep his house and everything else. So he's just told him what he had seen. And I can honestly say the state of this policeman when I spoke to him, uh, he, he, I had to refer him on, to, I signposted him on to, to go back to see his, his own psychiatrist. So this is the lack of understanding. This is, this is what we need to be aware of is transference, counter transference of how we interpret somebody else's experiences you know it's that internal frame our internal frame of reference is not the same as the person you go to help for 
the majority of the time that live script brings in their own external frame of reference you know, yeah. i.e did you sit at the hand of god what's it like on the other side hang on a minute i'm, I'm here for help i'm not here to tell you about what's going on so yeah this is uh, i hope that I hope that answers that question Okay, thank you, Raymond. Uh, many, many questions. So I'm going to uh, skip to the next one here is someone, uh, Amy would like to know how you recommend learning to develop the skill of seeing and listening. Thank you, Amy. That's a really great question. Um, very, I, I actually call it the cup method. Um, but there are other analogies. Uh, one I used the other day when somebody asked me that a very similar question was, um, do you know when the phone rings and you pick it up and you know who it is? You go, yeah, it's you. How did you know that? Is normally the answer. So this is something which I focus in on. It's that sensitivity. Or another one would be, I'm lying on the, I'm lying on the sofa or something and uh, made myself a cup of tea, haven't finished it, just put it on the side of the table there and the little voice goes, you don't take that out, you're going to knock that over. 20 minutes later, boom, it's on the floor. In actual fact, I did it today with my computer. I bought a new cable. Something said, if you leave this unwound, you're going to trip over it, Ray. And that's exactly what I did. So in a panic, got this talk this evening, have to get out during lockdown to buy a new cable. And all because I didn't listen to myself. So, you know, you can, you can do really simple stuff like that, like, you know, um, just stuff that doesn't hurt um you know and eventually it rules my day how am i going to do this today what am i going to do today now sometimes i might feel a little bit i don't believe in it so i'll, I'll go against it and see what happens so this is how i've learned so that you know it's, it's taken takes an awful long time amy um but like anything you know if you want to play guitar bass you've got to practice and, and this is no different to that you, you know, the, the, you know, the reason why we, we will continue playing guitar, we'll continue playing bass is because we get, we improve. And, and that is like anything else to, you must apply that to, to the scene. So in, in, in a nutshell, Amy, that's, that's where we're coming from. Start with the simple stuff, start with the stuff that isn't going to do you any harm. Start with that cup of water, um, start to understand questioning. I knew that, I knew that was going to happen. And what I say to you is, is how I tuned in on it. It's sensitivity. All of this is about sensitivity. It's believing yourself. And this is why I start with stuff that doesn't hurt you. It's, 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 it's trusting, um, you know, Wendy, Wendy Rose Williams, it's, um, uh, it's trusting your intuition. Um, this is what, you know, we can do this. You know, and again, it, this is not a gift, people. This is a skill I have and it applies to every, everything I do. So that's, that's the brief outline, Amy. That should help you to start anyway. Thank you, Raymond. Our next question is from Sarah. And Sarah wants to ask you, does striving to live a loving life make a difference in what happens to us in the afterlife? Ooh. <laughs> I'm going to be really truthful here. I do believe that it does make a difference. Um, I can only quote my mum. She said to me one day, you're a vicious man. And I, and I was a vicious man, uh, very vicious. I always wanted my pound of flesh. Uh, and, uh, very explosive. Um, and I believe that what has happened to me is, is, is some people think, oh my God, look what's happened to him. But you know, I believe in karma. And, uh, now, these days, ever since my event, my life is very boundaried. It's, uh, it, it, is, it is about walking that line. Uh, and, uh, you know, not, 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 you know, I still refuse to be slapped in the face and all that sort of stuff. I'll still fight you to the last breath, but I'm not a vicious man anymore. I, I, I love who I am now. I, I genuinely love who I am. I appreciate this. Um, I'm also very aware of all the harm that I've done to, to this beautiful body of mine. Um, it is the ultimate 
this is a gift. This, this is a gift. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, I am um, a strong believer in, in, in what you do re reflects on, on, on how your, your life may turn out on the other side. That's my, my belief. I, I'm shocked that I'm back here. I'm shocked um, that uh, I've been allowed to do what I'm, I've been allowed to do. So, you know, that there obviously is an awful lot of good still left in me, and, 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 I, and I thank God for that. Um, that was something which had come through for me. I was not, I was not a God-fearing person. I think uh, that didn't suit my lifestyle pre pre death. But by heck, uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer now. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, as my mother would say, there is a God, and uh, I used to think, get out of here. This is more fun being this way. <laughs> Uh, now it's just a complete reversal now. Um, yeah. Totally changed, man. Totally changed attitude. Um, I'm here to help. I think that kind of sums it up. Yeah. Awesome response, Raymond. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Dini. Lots of questions still. <laughs> I'm, I'm right. skipping. Uh, what does Raymond suggest for communities and individuals to handle the cond contagious COVID virus pandemic? Ooh, you might not like my answer. And the reason why you may not like it is because you need to remember that my fear of death is no more. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter. The only fear that I have about death, COVID doesn't frighten me at, at, at all. I, I, as I think I said earlier, I think what COVID has done has brought out our irrational fear of death. Um, you know, that life script of how it's been pushed into us you know, I, I, my father was, uh, was a Catholic. Uh, I, I remember we moved to Ireland, um, to Newry, and we were taught by nuns. And I remember seeing my two brothers get, they were, they were beaten up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so a four or five-year-old watching your two brothers get beaten up because they didn't eat their, 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 their food. Like, you know, it was, this is the power, the corruption that some within the Roman Catholic Church of who we had dealt with um, was, was, was pretty painful. And so it's, it's that life script again that, that interferes with our beliefs of how we are coping with, with, with COVID. You know, if I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, there's some beautiful stories of what people have seen on the other side. You know? and, and I think, again, I think it's wonderful of, of what you guys are doing because it's showing another side it 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 um it is beautiful and, and it's a struggle for all of what i do it's a struggle for me to stay here it's it's because of what i've seen you know it's it's um it's helping others that have kept me here so so the covid you know spoiler alert we've all got to go you know and um, I think if, if we're taught about what I have seen myself and what others have seen, you know, the beautiful side of it, don't be afraid. Just live every day. Go that little bit further. You know, do the best that you can do. Don't be judged by others. So, you know, that's sort of a be you. Because by being you, you'll, you will start to bring these skills out. Don't live your life to what others think you should be. Uh, so out of, out of everything, I mean, look at me, look, I wander around like this, uh, you know, constantly people are looking, but that's who I am, you know, and, and, and I refuse, as long as I don't hurt anyone, which I don't, I, re I refuse to change it in that respect. So that's, be you, that's, that's what I would say. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Thank you for that, Raymond. Uh, our next question for you is from Dini. And her question is, is the soul sexless? In your NDE talk, you describe being a sexless, disembodied soul and then meeting beings. But those beings had distinct gender. Can you please elaborate and explain this? Whoa, that's a great question. Man. I hadn't thought about that one. <laughs> Woo! Gini, you're on fire, girl. Um, We are sexless. That surprised me. That genuinely surprised me. Um, 
when I was on the other side, looking looking down at my feet. And in actual fact, um, while I waited to be to be seen on, on, on the other side, just before the wind came and touched me, I remember looking down and feeling embarrassed, you know, because I, because I was naked. There was, some, but the but the relief came was 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 when I looked down to see where where certain bits of me were supposed to be. They they just they just weren't, uh, and and that negated the. I'm, I'm totally naked. Do, do, I don't know whether one of the recurring dreams that I have to have when I was a kid was sitting on the bus in, in the underpants. I don't know whether any of you guys have had that dream, but it's that total feeling of feeling defenseless and, and vulnerable. Uh, that's how I felt on, on the other side. And, and I'd realized that you don't need to worry, Ray, because, because you ain't got your bits anymore. It's, you know, you're, you're only sort of so high uh, which which fitted because I was, you know, being a logical guy and thinking, well, your soul, how does it get back into your body? Uh, you know, it must be smaller. Um, and lo and behold, yes, um, it, it, it is smaller. But the sexless, yeah, um, bang on with that. But why the others were clearly identifiable, I don't know. The only answer I can give to that was... Um, or more insight I can give to that was was what I had found was that there was no power imbalance between the three ladies and the, and the two men, and I think if I was really to split the hairs of it, I would say that the women were more powerful than the two men. Uh, that that was what on um, with 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 reflection. But why their genders are identifiable in such an obvious way, I don't know. I, mm. I believe that when I turned up the sexless soul, the power imbalance is with me. Mm. Um, I'm there to be guided to what are we going to do? You know, how, you know, is he staying? Is, is, is he going? Um, you know, so I, I, haven't, I haven't got an answer for that. I wish I had, uh, but it's a great question. It, it really is a great question. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just to... To, to, to bring it up to speed, all I could say is, is that the power lied with those five individuals who, who were there. Uh, I felt that power. I felt the power of the wind. The wind was, is the guardian. You was not getting in if the wind didn't go, he's all right. And uh, so, so when the wind appeared, I knew as it went through my soul, I felt the power of, of the wind. And, uh, and then as it left, I felt that relief of, I'm allowed to be here. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's when the conversation started. So I'm sorry, I can't give you any more of an answer than that. Well, thank you, Raymond. This actually leads right into our next question. We have two more questions, then we'll have to wrap up. The next question is actually about your experience of the wind. This question comes from Londo. And he says, can you explain a bit more on the wind? As I have experienced a hot blowing wind in real life when there were no fans or such blowing in the house, have you ever experienced the wind in reality and not when you were seeing? Oh, um, but, uh, uh, oh that makes me a bit emotional actually. Um, there's a place where I was in summertime um, it's a very old country park close to me. It's called Darren Valley Park. And, uh, there's something about it. This, this old cemetery that I was sitting in is a, uh, a, a special site of scientific interest uh, that's recognized by the government. And I sat there, it's a beautifully hot day. I sat on this, on this, on this, on this bench, I was looking at the trees, I just, I just adore trees, and I could hear I could hear it was a poplar tree. It was a row of Victorian poplar trees planted in, 18, in, in uh, the 1850s, 1856, all, all down this path. And I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in the cemetery and I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the silence and I can hear this rustling. And it got to such a point where it started to annoy me. It was, it was breaking the peace, you know? 
So I, I remember turning and I've looked at this, this row of poplar trees and one side of the leaf is a dark green, the other side is, is, is a very light green, almost like a, a silver green. And as they flit in the wind, they reminded me of some castanets. And with, as the wind ran through them all, the noise was quite, you know, of the leaves rustling was, was interfering with, with my sense of peace. And I remember looking and that's when I recognized the wind. And uh, it, was, it was a beautiful moment. It was like meeting an old friend again. Uh, so it does happen. It happens. It's happened probably two or three times since the event. Twice this year that's happened. It's happened outside. So I get, it's almost like a communication um, as it runs through me. It's just an affirmation again of who you are, Ray, what you've been through. Um, you know, enjoy that connection. So yeah, I've done, but I have seen, I have seen and still have contact. So if the wind is touching you, lovely lady, just welcome me. It's not going to do you any harm. That's wonderful, Raymond. This will be our last question. There were tons of comments. Everybody loved what you had to say today. But just because of time, this will be our last question today. This one is from Dini again. And she says, uh, do you remember interference in your seeing skills or your third eye in certain environments or, for example, in electromagnetic fields? The only time I get interference, I don't get any interference from electromagnetic fields. Um, and the reason why I say that is because my, my um, sound room is full of speakers. Um, so any, whenever I turn anything on up there, the electromagnetic fields must be just pouring out. Um, and it's a place for me where I, where I find that it's the three S's, the stillness, the silence and the solitude. Um, it doesn't matter whether I've got a bank of equipment on. Um, if, if I'm in the right frame of mind, it, nothing, nothing really stops me. Even, um, even distances have, they don't, they don't, you know, but, uh, I was, I was asked, I have a beautiful Turkish family and um, something told me you have to, my sister was out there visiting with, with my beautiful mother and um, something said that I had to ring up. So I, I, I rang up and um, there was something wrong with one of the members of the family. And I worked through my sister. I told my sister what to do to, 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 to and, uh, and boom, the, re the response back was yeah, the, 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 the pain had gone. So the electromagnetic fields don't interfere. Uh, I'm not, that's for me, I can't say that it is for anyone else, but I've, I've done seeing and journeying um, on more occasions than I can actually remember, to be honest with you, uh, Dini. So um, no, it's, it's, you know, it, and if you feel it does, just, just have a walk out, have a walk out somewhere, get outside, and, uh, practice your skills practice them, practice, practice, keep a diary about what happened today. You know? If you see something, write it down, send yourself an email, particularly these days, just get your phone, phone out and book, 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 and, and it's there, it's stored. You know? and not only does it knock the skeptics, but it also helps you to, to realize that the way you're learning is, is, is you know, it's good for you. Because we all forget, you know, it's not, not there was, you know, I've got so many stories that, that's probably forgotten more than I've, I've actually spoken about. So don't don't fear that that, that Dini. Just you do what you got to do. And if you if you get stuck, you know where I am. Uh, just just drop me a line, and I'll do all I can to help. Anyway, thank you, Raymond. I'm now going to hand it over to Robert Bear if he unmutes himself. There we go, and Robert will give us the uh, the closing comments. Wonderful. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. That was a great presentation. And thank you, Simon. Thanks.
the Past Lives podcast for co-sponsoring this. That's okay. No problem. Both of you. Both of you. And um, I want to remind everybody that Spiritual Awakenings International has these online speaker events, usually the third Saturday of each month, except next month, December. Instead of having it during the holidays, we're going to have it on December 5th. And you're going to love our speaker. He's a Canadian, Dr. Christopher Kerr. He's going to be talking about uh, validating end of life dreams and visions. It'll be a great presentation. And um, I want to say goodbye from to the to our folks from across the pond, Raymond and Simon. Thank you again. Thank and you. Um, Yvonne, going to give it to you to close it out. Thank you, everybody. Uh, all right. Uh, so I just want to say to everybody, thank you. If you're not uh, yet a member of Spiritual Awakenings International, please subscribe on our website so you'll get notices of our upcoming meetings. The website is www.spiritualawakeningsinternational.org. So until next time, I'm going to say goodbye, au revoir, auf Wiedersehen, adios, buenos tardes, Arrivederci, Dash, and ciao. Bye, everybody. Love you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.